If it's Tuesday, Hunter Biden, the son of the sitting president, will plead guilty to two misdemeanors but avoid jail time after striking a deal with a Trump-appointed federal prosecutor. But that's not stopping Republicans from crying foul. Plus, former President Trump offers a new defense in his first interview since pleading guilty to federal charges, not guilty to federal charges, tied to his handling of classified documents. And abortion in America. Democrats launch a renewed push to expand abortion access and protect reproductive rights as we approach the one-year mark since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Kristen Welker in Washington. We begin with President Biden's son, Hunter Biden, reaching a plea agreement with federal prosecutors in a Delaware after a years-long investigation. This is the first time in history the Justice Department has brought charges against the child of a sitting president. Hunter Biden is expected to plead guilty to two federal misdemeanor counts of failing to pay his taxes. Two sources familiar with the agreement tell NBC News the Trump-appointed U.S. attorney has agreed to recommend probation, so no prison time for the president's son. Biden also faces a separate felony gun possession charge. That will likely be dismissed if he meets certain conditions. The agreement also suggests prosecutors did not find cause to charge Hunter Biden in relation to his business dealings with foreign entities. We are expecting to hear from President Biden shortly at an event in, on AI in California. We'll bring you any comment he makes on today's agreement. The president has largely stayed away from commenting on the investigation, but he recently spoke about it to MSNBC Stephanie Rule. Well, my son's done nothing wrong. I trust him. I have faith in him. And it impacts my presidency by making me feel proud of him. Republicans on the campaign trail and on Capitol Hill today have been outspoken in their attacks on today's plea agreement, accusing the Biden administration of a two-tiered system of justice, one for Biden and one for Trump. Donald Trump, who's of course facing federal charges related to classified documents, posted on social media that, quote, our system is broken. Several of Mr. Trump's fellow 2024 GOP candidates echoed those sentiments today and on Capitol Hill. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy condemned the Justice Department's decision to cut a deal. My first reaction is it continues to show the two-tier system in America. If you are the president's leading political opponent, the DOJ tries to literally put you in jail and give you prison time. If you are the president's son, you get a sweetheart deal. I'm joined now by Justice and Intelligence Correspondent Ken Delaney in Wilmington, Delaware, CNBC Senior White House Correspondent Kayla Tausche, and Capitol Hill Correspondent Ryan Nobles, who has the very latest reaction from Congress. So, Ken... Let me start with you. Break down these charges and this plea deal. What does it all involve? Well, Kristen, you heard the president say his son, Hunter Biden, has done nothing wrong. This plea deal flies in the face of that. Hunter Biden is admitting to crimes. He's admitting to two counts of willfully failing to pay his taxes in 2017 and 2018. The counts don't specify the exact sums, but we know that two years ago he paid more than a million dollars to the IRS to try to settle this back taxes bill. But it's also true that these are misdemeanors, punishable by up to 12 months in jail. But this is a plea agreement that calls for no jail time. It calls for probation. There's another felony gun charge um, that accuses Mr. Biden of essentially lying on a form where, that he used to purchase a gun, failing to disclose that he was addicted to drugs at the time. But that, uh, that charge is being handled through what's known as a deferred adjudication process, where if he complies with the conditions, um, the charge will not be brought and he will it will not be on his record. So uh, altogether, when you look at it, this is a pretty good outcome for Hunter Biden. His lawyer uh, told Katie Turr in the last hour that they're very satisfied with this, that they thought the prosecution handled these negotiations fairly. Um, and it comes in the context, it comes after a five year investigation that looked at the millions and millions of dollars that were paid to Hunter Biden by foreign entities, including in Ukraine and in China, and whether he did anything inappropriate or broke the law with regard to that. And no charges have been filed in connection with any of that conduct, which is one of the things that, you know, really gets the hackles of Republicans. They look at that and they say, well, that was a conflict of interest. That was corruption. But the Justice Department, the FBI looked at it and apparently found no criminal wrongdoing. Chris. And Ken, just put this into a broader context for us. Is this the type of deal that would be expected in this type of an investigation, this five-year 
long investigation. And also, it was notable that the statement said the investigation is ongoing despite this plea deal, right? That's right. So, but at first, in terms of the fairness, the harshness, the leniency of this, there is no way to judge it without knowing the facts because prosecutors cut deals all the time. The only way to know whether it was fair that they brought these charges is if you know what other charges they could have brought, more serious charges that they chose not to that they ch chose not to bring as part of a plea negotiation. We reported, for example, NBC News did that there was a felony tax charge on the table that wasn't brought. Right. So my colleague Ryan Riley just published a story that quoted legal experts saying these kinds of tax charges are rarely brought, and the gun charge almost never brought. But that often happens in plea deals where you, it's a settlement, right? So you, you, the, the defendant agrees to admit some charges and not others. In terms of the question of the investigation being ongoing, it's pretty clear to us at NBC News with our reporting that when it comes to Hunter Biden, this is wrapped up. And that's certainly what his lawyers are saying. They're saying they wouldn't have cut this deal if Hunter Biden was subject to further charges. But the DOJ has made clear that there is some aspect of this, whether it's other uh, other elements of conduct by other people, other aspects of this case that remain under investigation by the U.S. attorney here in Delaware, David Weiss. He's remaining in place. And he said very flatly in his news release, this investigation is ongoing. But we don't think that that means that Hunter Biden is subject to further charges, Kristen. Ken, thank you for that. Kayla, let me turn to you. We did get a statement from the White House. Tell us what the president, what the first lady is saying today. I know that they're not saying much. Um, but, but what are we anticipating? Because we are expecting these comments from President Biden on AI. Well, Kristen, in this very brief statement, which is the extent of the White House response at this point, the president and the first lady speaking really in their capacity as parents. I'll read you this brief statement. It says, the president and first lady love their son and support him as he continues to rebuild his life. We will have no further comment. Now, the first lady and the president both have public events happening this afternoon. President Biden in California, he's expected to talk for a few minutes about the threat of artificial intelligence and what the administration is doing to combat that and try to get in front of that threat. You can expect that reporters who are in the room will do their level best to lobby questions toward the president to get him to respond to this plea agreement. Uh, but as far as what West, West Wing sources are suggesting, silence is expected to be the strategy here, at least for the time being. Let the news cycle blow over and uh, let the Department of Justice and the attorneys for Hunter Biden speak for themselves, Kristen. Well, and of course, Kayla, we've been tracking this criticism from Republicans who say that this underscores the fact that there are two systems of justice, one for former President Trump and one for President Biden and Democrats. Are you getting any sense, because I've been talking to my sources and it seems like it's still a work in progress, of what the strategy is going to be to try to combat that narrative? Well, it seems like it's a strategy that's being built, uh, like a plane that's being built as it is in the <laughs> air. I mean, certainly last week, our, uh, some of our NBC News colleagues reported that there's this growing frustration among Democratic allies that the administration and the White House haven't done more to respond to the indictment and arraignment of former President Trump, to let the GOP flood the zone and own the messaging there. And they want the administration to do more to defend the Justice Department and defend the rule of law in this country. And so, you know, you can sort of extrapolate from that what might happen here, depending on how long this situation remains in the news, whether this silence can speak for itself or whether you're going to need more Democratic surrogates like Senator Chris Coons, who is out today suggesting that, you know, the fact that the U.S. attorney is a Trump appointee should indicate that this was fair, this was above board, um, you know, whether you'll see more voices like that come out of the woodwork to defend the situation here and, and how long that will take to happen, Kristen. And Ryan, let me turn to you. What type of reaction are you getting on Capitol Hill? Because I saw a number of statements that echoed what we saw from former President Trump, who called this a sweetheart deal. Yeah, Kristen, it, it does seem as though uh, the president, the former president's defenders here on Capitol Hill are following suit with that talking point. Many of them suggesting uh, that Hunter Biden was given nothing more than a slap on the wrist. And what's also interesting uh, is that there is still an ongoing investigation of Hunter Biden, the Biden family writ large, and their associates about their foreign business dealings to the House Oversight Committee. And that committee's chairman, James Comer, uh, is actually going into a secure location on Capitol Hill right now to look at auxiliary documents that are connected to that FBI tip sheet 
uh, that Comer believes is an explosive piece of investigative uh, information as it relates to what he's called a bribery scheme. Now, there's been no uh, additional evidence to back up that claim, and the ranking member of that committee, Jamie Raskin, has said uh, that he has been told by officials within the Justice Department uh, that the, the Justice Department, under then Attorney General Bill Barr, looked at this information and decided that it wasn't enough to pursue any further. But Comer actually latched on to that idea uh, in the David Weiss statement that their investigation is ongoing as a suggestion that perhaps there is more to this investigation into Hunter Biden uh, than what will uh, come to uh, a conclusion here with this tax case. So uh, that is a, a big part of the backdrop here on Capitol Hill. This is certainly not something that House Republicans are just going to let go uh, because this plea deal was reached. Yeah, let me just follow up with you on that, Ryan, because what are you expecting of the investigations in terms of the timeline of what obviously they are going to be taking place and unfolding against the backdrop of the 2024 re-election campaign of President Biden and the primary? Yeah, I, you know, and I think that is such an important part of this, uh, Kristen, because the Oversight Committee in particular, uh, but also the Judiciary Committee, which is, has done a lot of uh, work and has done a lot to try and to, to a certain extent, tarnish the reputation of the Justice Department and the FBI, have given no deadline for their work to be concluded. Uh, they uh, view it as an ongoing investigation. As information turns up, as people come forward, uh, they're going to take that information in and add it to their investigation. And they've never given any real kind of decision or a definitive uh, outcome as to what will be at the end of all of this. And, you know, unlike the January 6th Select Committee, which told us at the time that there'd be a final report with legislative recommendations, a narrative for what they say led to the, the events on January 6th, we've not seen a similar a promise from either the Oversight or Judiciary Committee. My guess is that this is just going to continue to be an issue that pops up time after time, that they're going to hold public hearings on this, that they're going to make it an issue in part so that it clouds to a certain extent what happens in the 2024 campaign. All right. Well, uh, I know you will watch it closely. Kayla and Ryan, thank you both so much for your great reporting. We are also following developments in the classified documents case against Donald Trump. The judge in that case has set the trial to begin in mid-August, less than two months from now. Although legal experts expect that date to be delayed because of motions filed by the former president's legal team, as well as the complex nature of the case. Mr. Trump, meanwhile, gave his first interview since pleading not guilty to 37 criminal charges and offered up a new defense when asked why he didn't return the classified documents subpoenaed by the Justice Department. Take a listen. The only way NARA could ever get this stuff, this back, would be please, 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 could we have it back? And they please, asked for them. Because they have no, we they were did talking. Ask for it. No, and they said, I gave can you give some, the documents back? And we were talking. And then they said, they went to DOJ to subpoena you to get them Which back. they've never done before. Right. And, and but why not just hand them over then? Because I had boxes. I want to go through the boxes and get all my personal things out. I don't want to hand that over to NARA yet. And I was very busy, as you've sort of seen. Yeah, but I've according very, to the indictment, busy. you then tell this aide to move to other locations after telling your lawyers to say you'd fully complied with the subpoena when you hadn't. But before I send boxes over, I have to take all of my things out. These boxes were interspersed with all sorts of things. I'm joined now by NBC News senior Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Hake and Mark Zaid, an attorney who focuses on national security and government investigations. Thanks to both of you for being here, Garrett. Let me start with you and what we heard from former President Trump in that interview, the mm -hmm. first time he's really spoken out since his latest indictment. What were your biggest takeaways from what we heard? Well, to me, that last answer is going to make his lawyers pull their hair <laughs> out. I mean, they have tried to argue that this should all be handled under the Presidential Records Act, not the Espionage Act under which he's charged. But Donald Trump misunderstood what the Presidential Records Act requires of him. He talks about wanting to sift through these boxes, pull out his personal items. If you've ever moved or relocated, you know how frustrating it is to have boxes piled up after the fact. We get that, but that's not how this law works. The law is very clear. You have to do this kind of thing before you are the ex-president, while you are still at the White House. So even on his preferred legal defense, he's wrong on the facts. The other part of that that jumps out to me is his answer when um, Brett Baer asked him about the specific document that he's on tape, apparently, sort of waving around and saying, look at this document, this war plan, it's still secret. Donald Trump tries to deny that that was actually a plan. He says, oh, no, we we're talking about newspapers, press clippings, that kind of thing. That's 
the kind of thing where he's probably going to be confronted with uh, uh, other facts under oath if this gets to trial. So um, a frustrating interview from a legal perspective, perhaps, for the former president, but maybe the kind of thing that buys him time politically and cover from some of his allies who can say he's out there talking about this. Yeah, Mark, pick up on this great point that Garrett is making. I mean, just how uncomfortable do you think this interview has made Mr. Trump's attorneys? Is, is he basically undercutting his own defense here? Well, he's testifying. This, you know, obviously no criminal defendant can be forced to take the stand against themselves, and many choose not to. And we've seen Donald Trump not take the stand in some of the other cases, including civil. But all of these interviews can and will be played during the course of the trial or at hearings, as the case might be. So, look, I think the attorneys for Donald Trump have already decided and acknowledged that they can't do anything to control their client, that what is at play here is a political strategy, not a legal strategy, because the political strategy can impact the legal strategy if he can win in November of 24. Uh, either if he doesn't win, then this case is going to be a big, big problem. So I think the strategies are in conflict with one another and the political strategy is winning the day as far as which one he's pursuing. Talk about this August 14th potential trial date. A, a lot of legal experts saying it's really unlikely we're going to see this case go to trial then. Why and what do you anticipate is going to happen between now and then to potentially push it back? And how far back are you thinking it'll get pushed? Right. I gasped when I saw the date. <laughs> and then, of course, I realized uh, it's just a routine scheduling order that has high hopes, but is going to be impacted by so many other things. I have a case against the U.S. government now in federal court, and we set a trial date for next year. And the judge in, in our case said the only thing that would move it is the apocalypse happening. <laughs> Not so the case with the Trump situation, because there are many issues particularly under the Classified Information Procedures Act, which we lovingly call SEPA, that will decide who has access to the classified records of his lawyers, the jury, uh, et cetera. And there will be many motions pre-trial that if a side loses, especially the government, they can immediately appeal it up to the 11th Circuit. So there are so many avenues that could reasonably, understandably, and legitimately delay this case. And we've all heard it many times before. The Trump legal strategy historically has always been delay, 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 delay. Mm -hmm. So his political strategy is to get the legal case to extend beyond the election of November 24. And because that could be his best saving grace. Garrett, let me turn back to you because we are waiting and watching to see if there will mm -hmm. be more indictments around January 6th around the efforts to overturn the election results in Georgia. Take us inside Trump world right now. What is the thinking and the strategy as they wait to see how those other cases play out? Well, there's two pieces to this. On the cases so far, they've seen fundraising boosts, polling mm -hmm. boosts. They don't look at this as a negative, politically speaking. It's forced the Republican Party to coalesce around Donald Trump. Everybody's using the language he wants them to use to talk about this, even the people who are running against him, with a few exceptions. But I think there's also an acknowledgement including sources whom I know you've spoken to, that, you know, this gets, the degree of difficulty gets higher here yeah. as these cases get more serious. And this documents case is particularly difficult for all the reasons Mark just laid out, the January 6th case, particularly the one in Georgia, which does look for all intents and purposes like there's going to be an indictment in early August, is going to be a much harder thing to explain away and opens more political vulnerabilities for his opponents. But the question has always been, are those opponents going to take those vulnerabilities or are they going to continue to make the same arguments that Donald Trump is making, which is that this is the DOJ out to get him. As long as other Republicans are using that same language, he can keep raising money off this and keep dancing with a plurality of Republican votes, potentially all the way through the primary calendar. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that. Mark, let me turn to you again. And as we talk about these other cases, as I just mentioned, one of them relates to January 6th. That, based on all of my reporting, based on my conversations with legal experts, is trickier uh, to charge. Talk a little bit about that and what you're watching for there. It, it is a much trickier case. Now, what is cleaner is that obviously it would be heard in the District of Columbia federal court. There's no venue concern as there was with the Trump classified document case. But it is 
incredibly unprecedented to bring these types of charges against a public official, essentially incitement. Now, of in conspiracy to create uh, such an incitement, as well as obstruct congressional proceedings, etc. Uh, I represent actually the estate of police officer, Capitol Police Officer Brian Sicknick. We're suing Donald Trump uh, to be very uh, clear about it. And part of our claim is on the civil side, tying it to potential criminal charges. That doesn't mean the Justice Department will go the same way that, that we have gone in that argument, uh, but it is at least there. Our, our civil burden is much lower than obviously the criminal burden that the government would have to prove. But if that case is brought against Donald Trump, you can expect that it was based on a significant and serious considered level of determination and, and decision making by the Justice Department that they think they have a case, right? This is not going to be one where they push the envelope in any shape or form. This isn't a test case. That's not what the Justice Department wants. So if they bring it, that means they can win it. And, and if I were Donald Trump, I'd be very concerned. Okay. Well, we will watch and wait and see what happens. Garrett Haig, Mark Zaid, thank you both so much. And coming up, we'll have more on the political fallout from the legal investigations into both Donald Trump and Hunter Biden and what it means for the 2024 race, plus the scion of a Democratic dynasty running against President Biden. We'll talk to the NBC reporter who spent time recently with conspiracy theorist Robert F. Kennedy Jr. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Turning to the 2024 presidential race. At this moment, the closest thing President Biden has to a challenger for the Democratic presidential nomination is a run by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Despite being a member of a Democratic dynasty, Kennedy's views on Ukraine, COVID, and especially vaccines do not align with the Democratic Party. He's long been one of the top anti-vaccine advocates in the U.S. My NBC colleague, Brandy Zdrozny, recently spent some time with Kennedy, and he told her as president he would order his Justice Department to investigate medical journals and gut the federal agencies that regulate childhood vaccines. Joining me now is NBC News senior reporter, Brandy Zdrozny. Apologies for mispronouncing your last name, Brandy. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. So what were your key takeaways from your interview with Robert F. Kennedy Jr.? So uh, I wanted to profile him in the first place because I had been watching his campaign uh, events. I've been watching his speeches. I watched his kickoff. I've been looking through his materials. And never once does he mention vaccines, which, um, you know, that'd be like the president of Ford refusing to say the word car. It was really, really noticeable. This is his life's work really leading the anti-vaccine movement. And so um, I wanted to talk to him about why he was doing that. And, you know, to us, like you just mentioned, I think it's pretty obvious. <laughs> And it's because his policies and his ideas are incredibly unpopular with Democrats. And that's, you know, the party that he insists he wanted to lead. Um, I think the public should sort of know what these vaccine policies would be if he gets into office, right? We're not talking about odds here. I think we're more talking about stakes. So what would he do if he got in, into office? And, you know, like you just said, he would gut the agencies, the FDA, the CDC, the NIH, and he would instead um, of the puppets who he says currently are there, he would install people that he believes would be better. Um, and considering, you know, Kennedy's close contacts right now are anti-vaxxers and discredited doctors. That's really scary for public health. Um, I asked about childhood vaccines. I asked whether he would ban them, sort of like Trump's Muslim ban. And he wouldn't say, but he suggested that they should be studied more, which basically means uh, effectively they'd be paused and withheld from children when we know that they're safe and effective. Well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, he's not polling at zero. He does have some small support put his support in, into context, and are, are people responding to him because his last name is Kennedy? I mean, I, I was reading something that a lot of people don't, re, as you're saying, don't really understand what his policies would look like at this point. 
Yeah, the polling that we've seen, he has up to between 17 and 20 percent are the recent ones that I've seen. And then when you get into the meat of the poll, nobody knows who he is or what he's about. They're sort of open to him because he's a Kennedy. And we know, you know, what name recognition can do. And and so does he. But, you know, we have that that core group of sort of Camelot nostalgists mm. and, and people who would love a Kennedy. But there is also a core of very interesting um, sort of spoilers um, some people are suggesting, right? And these are sort of, there's a lot of billionaire tech bros like uh, Twitter's Jack Dorsey, Elon Musk, who are sort of courting him and um, suggest and throwing um, other, some other tech billionaires were throwing fundraisers for him last week. And these sort of to be, these seem to sort of be um, like a provocateur, right? Who are pumping Kennedy as a spoiler candidate. Um, mm -hmm. So we have two really interesting sort of pockets of support right now. And of course, there's a very, very large contingent of the anti-vaccine community, which has only grown during COVID. So that's a big, big um, bucket of support. And we focused largely on his anti-vaccine agenda. What are some of his other key policies? Well, um, as you might imagine, right now, their very big picture, it's, you know, peace. He, he wants to be the peace candidate. His um, campaign manager is D Dennis Kucinich, who um, lost the Democratic presidential primary twice or lost once and then backed out once. Um, so that's very big in, in, in his campaign materials and in his speeches. He wants to be the candidate of peace. He also wants to be, and, and sorry, how he would do that specifically is again, very unpopular with Democrats right now is that he wants to pull support from Ukraine. He thinks Ukraine is a proxy war from neocons in the Democratic Party. So he wants to pull support and broker a peace, which he hasn't gotten into exactly how he'll do. But the pop talking points he talks about right now are very um, Russian apologists, I think it would be fair mm. to say. That's a lot of his critique. Um, so the party of peace, and then just his big thing is he wants to be the party of unity. You know, he said on Joe Rogan this weekend that he was going on these podcasts because he could get the far left and the far right support that way. And in the end, his campaign would be about, you know, bringing those pieces together. It's this, you know, theory known as the horseshoe theory and um, political science speak, but it's where you have the two extremes on the political spectrum. And that's what he wants to bring together. Um, no real, um, no real idea how he's going to do this, but that is what his campaign is saying they're all about. It is a fascinating read. Brandy Zadrozny, thank you so much. Appreciate it. And joining me now on set is NBC News senior national political reporter Sahil Kapoor, former North Dakota Democratic senator and CNBC contributor Heidi Heitkamp, and former Pennsylvania Republican Congressman Charlie Dent. Thanks to all of you for being here. Sahil, I have to start with you. And you just heard Brandy talk about the fact he's polling in some polls at 17 percent. What do you make of this campaign by Robert F. Kennedy Jr.? That's right. He is polling higher than many might have expected when this person came out of nowhere. But I think RFK Jr. is, is revealing a little bit more about President Biden than he is about himself. Let's take the polls where he's doing the best, high teens, maybe 20 percent, the poll with 20 percent. He's still 40 points behind Joe Biden, so he's not seriously in the picture. But what he is showing is that a lot of President Biden's support is soft. A new poll today out by mm. CNN kind of confirms this. His favorable rating, and this is not approval rating. His approval rating is a little higher, but his favorable rating, which is kind of the gut feeling voters have about him, it's only 32% nationally. Among Democrats, it's 73%. Among liberals, 65%. Among young voters under 35, it's 24%. Mm. That's a lot of people who are deeply skeptical yeah. about Joe Biden. Now, I can already hear the campaign saying, this is early, you know, once there's Trump yeah. is on the other side, it'll focus the minds that a lot of these people will come home. But at the very least, what it proves, Kristen, is that this, this campaign, the Biden campaign, has a lot of work to do to bring these voters home because there are concerns about his age. That spans, you know, left, uh, uh, center left, uh, moderate. There are concerns among progressives that he's not quite progressive enough, that he's not feisty enough about these things. Young voters don't really identify stylistically with a member of the silent generation. So there is work to do. Senator, how concerned are Democrats about all of these numbers that Sahil just lays out? Because they don't necessarily think Robert F. Kennedy is going to yeah. beat President Biden, but he certainly is exposing some weaknesses. Yeah. I think people are a lot less concerned about Robert Kennedy than they are the numbers that you just heard, mm. the favorability mm. numbers. Those are real numbers that need to be, they need to improve dramatically. And, I, you know, if you're Joe Biden, what you say is don't compare me to no one, get, get to the almighty, compare me to the opposition. 
election. I think a lot of the strategy is Donald Trump is going to be the president. That's a choice people have made before. Biden won that choice. Um, we have uh, he has now a record to run on. And so I think that what their their nose is down, their head is down. Just get get through this process. If on the other end, it's it's uh, Donald Trump with all of his baggage. They feel pretty good about where they are. And I don't think they're seriously concerned about Kennedy. But if you look at what you said, 70 favorabilities among Democrats is in the 70s, that would explain the numbers where you see alternatives being about 20 percent. Representative Dent, what do you make of this? And then I want to turn to Hunter Biden. Yeah, I think there's a look, there's a softness of support for Joe Biden among a lot of Democrats. He's going to be the nominee, right. but so some some Democrats are looking for alternatives, whether it's Robert F. Kennedy or Williamson, neither of whom are going to get real traction, I think, at the end of the day. And we'll see how much tolerance Democratic voters have for conspiracy theorists with Robert F. Kennedy Jr., because it's just not going to go anywhere. But he's going to be a gadfly. I think that is one of the key questions. You're absolutely right. President Biden is making remarks about AI out on the West Coast, and he was just asked about his son, Hunter Biden, I want to play a little bit of, of what we heard from him and get everyone's reaction on the other side. Senator, let me go to you on this. He says, I'm very proud of my son. He's being very measured in his comments about this. Just to remind everyone, Hunter Biden pleaded guilty to two misdemeanor counts, failing to pay his taxes. How significant is this? And politically speaking, of course, you have Republicans saying this was a sweetheart deal. Well, I don't think it was a sweetheart deal. I think, you know, uh, is Donald Trump going to even plead guilty to misdemeanors and handling documents? I mean, you look at this and, and when when you have these challenges, as he did, um, and, and America can identify with kids who are addicted, who make bad mistakes, who should pay the consequences. And, and, and Biden's response here is not as president of the United States. His response is as a father. And I think there's a lot of empathy throughout the country. We have a huge addiction problem in this country. People have seen the consequences of that. And I think they can be fairly sympathetic. It's not going to stop the conspiracy theories or the, oh, my God, you got a sweetheart deal kind of discussion. But I think it, it does show consequences for bad behavior on Hunter Biden's part. Can Republicans make the argument it's a sweetheart deal when this was a deal that was struck with a Trump-appointed attorney, U.S. attorney? It, it's going to be very difficult for Republicans to make that case. In, in fact, I would argue that with Hunter Biden, you know, he's not the principal in this case. Mm. The principals are Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Donald Trump's legal challenges are far more consequential than Hunter Biden's, uh, who's a very troubled you know, uh, man, obviously. So I think at the end of the day, you know, unless they can really tie Hunter Biden directly to Joe Biden or Joe Biden to the Jim Biden, they're going to have a tough time with this. So I, I think it's a losing issue. And you're right. This is a Trump appointed prosecutor who made the case. So it's it's really a, it's I think it's bad for Republicans to continue to go off about American law enforcement, FBI, Justice Department being, you know, be, being in the tank for the Democrats. And can I add something to this? They tried for three weeks this whole, there was a FBI informant, and now we're coming forward, and Biden took a bribe, and the whole thing went poof, mm. because it wasn't real. And so exactly to your point, Charlie, that, that they can't tie any of Bi uh, Hunter Biden's issues to Joe Biden, but Trump's issues he owns. And right. also, he's the principal. Go ahead, Sam. It was also largely inevitable that Republicans would level this criticism. They're very committed to this argument yes. that the DOJ is anti-Republican, anti-Trump, has been, you know, in their, in their words, politically targeting Trump for a while now. You can't really pivot from that to say, oh, great job, DOJ. You busted the president's son. He now has a criminal conviction. He's pleading the charges. That's not common. But I think they're very committed to this narrative politically. They are, and, and it, they're helped by the fact that these investigations are going to move forward on Capitol Hill. They absolutely will. I think Speaker McCarthy has said they want more information about it. There's a little tiff going on about whether it's closed and what, you know, whether it's now legitimate to demand that information. I think uh, James Comer at the Oversight Committee is also mm -hmm. going to move forward with this. Another interesting figure, Steve Daines, the NRSC chairman, is very, is, is very vocal on this, siding with Trump, claiming there's a two-tier system of justice. I wonder how that's going to play in Senate races. Is that play in Wisconsin and Michigan? Yeah, yeah. There's, there's definitely a two-tier system of justice, and Trump's taking advantage of it. <laughs> what what, to, what should it. the strategy be, though, Senator, like inside the... Because I've been talking to uh, Democratic officials. They don't quite have their head wrapped around what their counter-argument is going to be. You see how the White House is dealing with it. They're not really engaging. 
um, to the extent possible. But what should the strategy be? The strategy should be let DOJ do its job. And just as we saw with the January 6th committee, every time we saw more and more evidence being presented, the public got more and more concerned yeah. about what happened that day. Every day we see more evidence being presented in this documents case, the more the public is going to go, I don't like that. Yeah, uh, and you're already seeing some Republicans back off. Yeah, and, look, and Chris Ray was appointed by Donald Trump, mm -hmm. the head of the mm -hmm. FBI. Yeah. I mean, this is a pretty tough case to make. I mean, he's not a Democrat. I mean, he's a pretty fair-minded guy. Uh, and so I, I think Republicans, as a party that had always been historically party of law enforcement, is, you know, is tarnishing its reputation on this, particularly at the federal level, not as much at the state and local level, on this issue of uh, uh, you know, undermining uh, federal law enforcement. Let's talk about what we heard from former President Trump. Sahil, to what extent uh, the president making some of his most extensive comments yet about the charges against him. I mean, if you're one of his attorneys, you've got to be nervous about the fact that he said, yeah, I couldn't go through all this stuff in my boxes because I'm a busy man. I had so many papers to go through. Yeah, everything Donald Trump says on television can and probably will be yeah, used against right. him in a court of law. I mean, if you're his lawyers, you must be very nervous about the fact that he's going to be out there unfiltered, saying exactly what he what he wants. And yes, there's no there's no penalty for lying on the campaign stump. But that stuff can come back to haunt him. And it's happened again and again and again. His lawyers have to clean things up in court. Yeah. Judges sometimes tend to be deferential about this stuff. But now he's facing uh, charges in New York and federally. There might be more coming in Georgia. How do you how do they handle that? Yeah. Well, look, if the senator and I had walked out of a classified briefing with classified documents and then taken them home and the DOJ knocked on the door and so we want them back, we said, no, we're too busy to go find them. You know, I, no, no, there's no negotiation. You know, they, they would take them or they, they take us in handcuffs. So I, I just, they take I'm, them and us. Oh. And that's the counter argument from Trump's critics, that he's the one getting a sweetheart deal because basically yeah, the well, Justice Department, in his view, said, please just give us back the yeah. documents and we'll let it go. It's yeah. a two-tiered system. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. And Trump's taking I, advantage. I just can't imagine. I mean, I, we've been through so many classes classified briefings. Mm. We just looked at paper. We never had... I don't know how... And then you left. Were. And then you left the yeah, room. we left it there. Yeah. Oh, no, you we, had to. And we wouldn't even think of taking it with us, let alone taking it home. Well, and, and, you know, yeah. the, this Final whole point. idea of, I was too busy to go through the boxes. Well, then have somebody else go through the boxes. You know people who know classified documents. He is a hoarder, it seems to me. But he also... You know, you, you still wonder, was it just hubris and kind of their mind, 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 kind of a, a second grader kind of attitude? Or was there some more nefarious mm -hmm. reason for him keeping those documents? Mm -hmm. And that's a question that I think needs to be explored in, in the political realm and the legal realm. Yeah, and it, among the questions he'll likely continue to have to answer. Thank you so much for a great conversation. Really appreciate it, Sahil, Heidi, and Charlie. Up next, rescuers are racing against time to find a missing submersible lost deep in the ocean with five people on board and very little air left to breathe. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. The U.S. Coast Guard and other rescuers are racing against the clock looking for a submersible that disappeared during a dive to, Titanic to the Titanic wreckage site. The Coast Guard says so far the search for the missing vessel with five passengers on board has yielded no results. Officials estimate the submersible has approximately 40 hours of breathable air left. If your submersibles can find this sub, is there any way to retrieve it and save the people on board? Yeah, so right now, all of our efforts are focused on finding the sub. Um, what I will tell you is we have a group of, of uh, our nation's best experts in the Unified Command. And if we get to that point, uh, those experts will be looking at what the next course of action is. The submersible part of an Ocean Gate Expeditions tour that allows passengers to explore the Titanic wreckage went missing on Sunday after losing contact with its research vessel. The five people aboard include Stockton Rush, the CEO of the expedition company, British billionaire and adventurer Hamish Harding, a prominent Pakistani businessman and his son, and a maritime expert who works with the company that owns the salvage rights to the Titanic wreck. The price of a spot on the submersible was $250,000. It was only on its third trip since OceanGate Expeditions began offering the trip in 2021. After the break, Democrats in Washington prepare to mark one year since the Supreme Court's pivotal Dobbs decision. We'll have new reporting on Senate Democrats' renewed push for abortion rights legislation live on Capitol Hill next. You're watching Meet the Press now.
Welcome back. Democrats in Washington are marking one year since the Dobbs decision, the Supreme Court ruling that overturned Roe v. Wade, using the anniversary to draw attention to the fight for abortion access and the state of maternal health care across the country. Today, First Lady Jill Biden held an event at the White House. The First Lady will also join the president and vice president for an event on Friday before the anniversary on Saturday. And on Capitol Hill, Senate Democrats are expected to bring a number of abortion messaging bills to the floor this week, forcing Republican lawmakers to get on the record on this issue. Joining me now to discuss all of this is NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale. So, Ali, we just heard from the First Lady about this, talking to Jen Klein, who's, of course, the director of White House Gender Policy Council. What did we hear today? Yeah, look, what we heard from Dr. Biden is the message that we've seen from her before, one of reassurance that her husband's administration is doing what they can to protect abortion access. But also the reality here is what it is on Capitol Hill, which is that we're in a period of divided government. Even when Democrats held both houses of Congress, they didn't have the numbers they needed to pass any kind of federal codification that would protect access to abortion. And so now we're watching the White House just try to continue to bring awareness, to continue energizing this issue, because we watched the way that in 2022, in the midterms, it was able to galvanize voters in Democrats' directions, and they're hoping that that's something that they can see again in 2024, making promises for the most part that if they were to retake the majority in the House and be able to expand their majorities in the Senate, then maybe something could be done on the federal level to reverse the court's action of getting rid of the constitutional right to an abortion or at least those protections that had previously been offered. And, Ali, of course, we've been tracking what the vice president, what the first lady are planning to do on Friday to mark this anniversary. What are you yeah. anticipating? How are they planning to mark this day? Well, look, already we saw those images of the First Lady gathering with women who have their own abortion stories to tell. I've been doing my own reporting about this with other people willing to share their stories ahead of this anniversary. And I think it's really going to be continuing to highlight the wide range of experiences here that show that abortion is health care. In so many of these conversations, you see women who are talking about having children who they very much wanted, but then having to go through miscarriages where they miscarriage carry so badly that they are septic and their lives are in danger. At that point, in some of these states with more restrictions, that is the only point when doctors are actually able to intervene. And so sharing those stories, bolstering the idea that abortion is health care, is so central to the way that the White House and Democrats are trying to message around this issue. It's, I imagine, what we're also going to hear from Vice President Kamala Harris, who's been a leading voice on this, not just talking about it through the lens of maternal health, but also digging into the numbers around black maternal mortality in this country. Those numbers are much higher than the national average, and certainly that's something Harris has been able to bring awareness to. But doing so now, in light of the Dobbs decision, at the one-year milestone of that decision from the Supreme Court is going to be important. And the way that the White House continues to leverage Harris is also going to be really interesting from a 2024 perspective, as they expect this issue to be really energizing politically, and the role that she plays within the White House in affecting their policy strategies around this, too. And just very quickly, Ali, we're expecting some new legislation to be introduced by Senate Democrats. What can you tell us about that in the last 30 seconds we have left? Yeah, Kristen, well, they'll at least try to introduce it, because again, the reality is what it is here on Capitol Hill. But de Senate Democrats, I'm told, are going to try to push several of what they're calling common sense reproductive rights bills. Those are things like protecting data privacy, making it so that women are able to travel over state lines for care. All of the things that we've heard them discuss before, they're going to try to get Republicans on the record for again, because as we've noted, they can't do anything now, but they're going to try to leverage this politically for the future. Well, Ali Vitale, I know you have been doing a lot of reporting around this issue. We really appreciate your joining yeah. us. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Thanks. And this Thursday at 10.30 p.m. Eastern, we have a Meet the Press special examining the impact of the decision overturning Roe and the impact in medicine and politics, culture, and beyond. Don't miss it. Still to come, today is World Refugee Day, and the U.N. says the global refugee crisis has reached record levels. We'll delve into that. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Countries around the world are celebrating World Refugee Day, an international day designated by the U.N. to recognize refugees around the globe. According to the U.N., more than 108 million people have been forcibly displaced worldwide due to persecution, conflict or human rights violations. Since taking office, President Biden pledged to reverse the Trump-era immigration policies, including 
rebuilding America's refugee program. As the White House deal with immigration in a post Title 42 world, it is increasingly relying on partner nations to stem the flow of illegal migration. That includes countries like Colombia, which continues to support millions of Venezuelan refugees fleeing political and socioeconomic instability back at home. According to the UN, Colombia already is already host to the third largest number of refugees. Joining me now on set is Colombia's ambassador to the U.S., Luis Gilberto Murillo. Thank you so much for being here, Ambassador. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Kirsten, for this invitation. I appreciate your being here on set. So tell me, you and I were talking about this a little bit in the break. What is the current situation as it relates to refugees in Colombia? As you know, Colombia has welcomed almost 3 million Venezuelan refugees. This is uh, the largest uh, number of, ref of refugees, of migrants, in the Western Hemisphere. And is, we, we are having a very significant investment, almost two points of our GDP, to support that population in need. And also, we are providing them with a, a legal pathway to integrate to Colombian society. Uh, just almost two million of these uh, refugees, of these migrants from Venezuela, already received temporary protective status. Uh, from then, almost uh, 1.8 million receive health services and are about 600 thousand uh, mm. uh, uh, children and youth also have access to education regardless of their migration status. You're getting support from the United States, from other countries, but you say it's not enough. What do you need? What is your message to these other countries about what you need to support th these refugees? Well, we almost have uh, uh, like more than 200 years of relation with the United States. This is a strategic relation. We are strategic partners. And we are working together within the framework of Los Angeles Declaration to support uh, migrants in the entire Western Hemisphere, particularly in Colombia. But the uh, support that we are receiving is not enough. We need mm -hmm. to look for other ways to support Colombia for humanitarian response, for integrating uh, Venezuelans to uh, uh, the Colombian society, also for providing them with dignity and hope in life. And in that regard, we're also working with other countries in the region, with Ecuador, with Panama, to really respond to this challenge that is really we have shared responsibility. And that's something that we are working with the United States. We are thinking about improving the way those migrants can really access to some legal pathways to come to the United States, some of them. And obviously, we've been tracking the impact here of Title 42 being lifted. What has the impact been in Colombia? What have you seen? Well, we see more uh, migrants like using Colombia as a transit country. We see so migrants. So your numbers have only gone up. In are going up. It's like we are, we are seeing uh, migrants coming not only from Venezuela, but, but also from Haiti, from Cuba. And those migrants are crossing the Darien Gap without very difficult conditions. It's very dangerous. And they are also target of all this criminal network of human trafficking. And this is a challenge that we are, we are trying to respond in a very uh, a collective manner with other countries. What we need really, what we need is really uh, more support to have. We are working with the United States to create center of safe, uh, uh, we're, we're saying this center for safe processing of migrants, uh, for safe mobility. And the idea of this center is to really allow this migrant to have all the processing in country, in Colombia, to avoid crossing this Darien Gap, another uh, illegal ways of coming to uh, the United States. That's very important in terms of responding to the challenge of exposing these families to these danger, dangerous conditions. And I know that Colombia has called on sanctions on Venezuela to be lifted. Do you think it is time for the Biden administration to engage with the Venezuelan government? What would you like to see in that regard? Well, what President Petro uh, discussed with President Biden is to, to look for ways to uh, respond to the challenges of open democracy mm -hmm. in Venezuela. And there are different ways to do that. First is to have Venezuela really 
moving into fair and open, transparent, and competitive elections. That's very important. Mm -hmm. And to allow to provide guarantees for the, for the opposition in Venezuela to participate in elections. Second is to see how in, in some kind of benchmark to lift some of the sanctions. But also you need to see some specific measures taken by the Venezuelan government. Mm -hmm. In addition to that is to have Venezuelan government and the opposition to return to negotiations in Mexico to advance some of the commitments that you already were, were made in terms of creating a trust fund managed by the UN to also have some funding for humanitarian response to the needs of Venezuelan within the country that are suffering. And we are sure that within that pathway, you can see really securing democracy in that country. Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us to discuss this incredibly complex and complicated situation. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Be with you. And thank you for being with us this hour. Chuck is back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. NBC News Now coverage continues with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.